So the next stage that we want to do during sign-off is what we call IR drop-in electromigration analysis. So we can do several types, and uh, for example, Cadence provides a tool called Voltus um, that does this. Uh, Primetime uh, has a tool that does it. Different companies have tools that do this type of uh, these types of analysis. Static IR drop analysis assumes a voltage drop that uh, when we have uh, constant current that's going through the chip. Um, it's not really sufficient for modern technologies, but it says, okay, we have standard cells that are distributed all over the chip, and each standard cell has some sort of a, um, a constant current, average current that it dissipates. We know where the different pads are that are providing us with our power or our ground around. We know what the power grid that is bringing them to every area of the chip is, so we can um, figure out what the resistance is from the power rails into uh, into each and every one of our transistors or gates, uh, and we know what the average currents th that's going to be flowing there, and then we can draw one of these nice color maps that will show us what kind of a um, IR drop we expect to have everywhere. So this red area would be some sort of hot spot. We'd want to maybe make a thicker power grid or put an additional power pad somewhere um, close to this area. It's also worth doing this very early on in the, in the flow. Um, while you're doing floor plan, already run some of these early rail analysis is to see where you're going to have these types of IR drop problems. That's static IR drop. But it's not, um, it's not a real and true type of a uh, check. We actually want to know what happens when um, we have different types of operations. Then we have actual current pull that's going to be happening usually very close to the clock edges. So that's dy dynamic IR drop analysis. We need to know what the switching activity is of the logic. We usually use a, a VCD file. A VCD is a, a, a vector change dump file. It's uh, put out by the logic simulator, and it will tell us um, where uh, each and every gate, when uh, for each time step is changing. So we can take usually not a long simulation, but uh, maybe try to find a worst case simulation where a lot of our gates are going to be um, changing at once and then take the VCD file out of that, plug it back into our power analysis tool and it will show us um, usually like a little movie uh, of how our IR drop is uh, happening across the chip over that um, simulation time. Um, so it shows our peak current demand. Uh, you often run it at the fast, fast corner with high voltage, high temperature and RC worst extraction. So those are two types of IR drop analysis that you should run um, to, to make sure you don't have IR drop problems, to make sure that your power grid is sufficient and so forth. Um, the electromigration analysis is usually run in a similar type of a tool. It uses a similar type of algorithms to run the analysis. And here, what we're actually checking is that we don't have too much current that is running through the different uh, uh, in, in, through the different interconnect layers, because if we have a lot of current, um, eventually, um, as a reliability problem, the current is going to cause uh, shorts or opens due to electromigration. So we really check the current density through the different wires and see if we have any problems and have to go and make a wider wire. Since traditionally, most of the current in a, in a MOS um, type of a structure goes through VDD and ground. So this was always run only on the rails. So we ran it on a VDD rail, on a ground rail, etc. But um, recently, because of the inter high interconnect scaling, and we have very small interconnects which get high current density, we also run signal EM, which is actually checking electromigration problems on signal lines as well. So those will highlight um, problems that we may have, and we have to go back and again make uh, lines bigger, wider, or uh, etc. The next part that I want to discuss is logic equivalence. So um, basically, what we've shown here in our whole flow that we've gone through throughout the course is we take some sort of a, of a high-level high definition of a, of a hardware language, let's say a Verilog file. We run, uh, you know, synthesis, we run place and route and so forth, and we get a layout at the end, and we get uh, a net list at the end. That's kind of our uh, final part. To make sure that the layout and the netlist are the same, we run LVS, as we'll discuss in a minute. But how do we know that the Verilog netlist that we got is actually the same as the RTL that we plugged into here and that we ran all our verification, all our logic verification was done on our RTL? So we have to run logic equivalence or LEC between them. Um, that's a formal verification check where we make sure that the Boolean uh, functionality of the RTL and the Boolean functionality of the gate level are exactly the same. And um, we actually discussed a little bit with BDDs and so forth how this can be done quite easily, um, though 
there's a lot of tricks, uh, tips and tricks in, in, on the way, and there are tools that do this. Okay, for example, the Cadence tool is called Conformal, and that's an synopsis one is called Formality. Actually, it's pretty hard to do that because a lot of a lot changes between the original RTL and the final netlist. We add and subtract a lot of um, different types of gates, and we do a lot of uh, f funny stuff. So what you should do is run a logic equivalence between every two stages that you run in your design. For example, we take our RTL, we run synthesis, we get a net list already there, we're going to run LEC. Um, and if we have a LEC passing, uh, this logic equivalence passing between our RTL and this net list, then we can go and on the next stage, we just run logic equivalence between the net list that we started with and the net list that comes out at each stage. Um, what's so, so special about this stage is that we have different types of things like the design wares and so forth that we discussed. You can um, implement an adder with many different Boolean, uh, 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 Boolean uh, implementations of it, and they will not be logically equivalent. So you, the uh, RTL tool has to actually tell the logic equivalence tool about how it implemented this type of an adder or some other to, uh, uh, some other block, and then the logic equivalence will know how to take that into account when it's running LEC and say that the netlist that comes out of here is the same. But when we go to the next stage, the netlist should be really um, the same e exact type of a thing. So. Our next stage that we're going to do during sign off is what we call a layout or physical verification. And here um, we have design rule check or DRC. So we've discussed a little bit about DRC um, during the course, but uh, DRC, uh, we should run a full chip DRC, which actually takes our GDS, sticks it into an external um, uh, accurate DRC tool that has a rule deck that tells all the different DRC rules that were defined by the foundry and runs DRC on it. There are uh, all kinds of extra checks that we need to, to run, such as uh, DFM and, uh, and DFY and different things for how we are going to um, tape out the, the chip according to the package maker and so forth. So there are lots of different rule decks and so forth that we may have to, to run on this. I also mentioned before the density fill is uh, is created actually with the DRC tool usually and antenna checks are also run with this DR DRC tool. Uh, tool and this gets very very complex as we go into newer and newer technologies you can see the rise in the amount of rules that actually we had going from 180 to 65 nanometers and it only got a lot worse since then so drc check is one of these things that we have to do um, another one is the lvs or layout versus schematic so what that is actually is we want to check and make sure that the gds that we're taping out um, which is just a bunch of polygons is the same as the verilog net list that uh, we that we created and and uh, we want to make it, the, the problem is that uh, we have different abstracts that we use along the way, lefts and all kinds of black boxes. And we want to make sure that their connectivity is correct and that we didn't lose any information along the way. So our actually uh, uh, what we, we thought we were taping out is what we're actually taping out. How do you do that? You extract the layout, the GDS, and you build a spice netlist from your, your Verilog netlist with a tool called V2LVS or something like that. Um, and, uh, and then you export uh, uh, again. So you take your GDS. DS, you extract the spice netlist from it, you export your Verilog netlist, and you translate it into a spice netlist, and then we do formal verification between the two spice netlists with the LVS tool, and it will tell us if they're exactly the same or we made some mistake somewhere. There's also another check that's usually run within the LVS tool, which is called electrical rule check. It, it checks for shorts, floating nets, well biasing, and all kinds of things like that. Um, this is a very complex and, and important uh, type of flow, this uh, physical verification on the full chip. And I actually created a short course on it called Digital on Top Physical Verification, and you can find it on my YouTube channel. Um, when we run this uh, DRC on our, and actually LVS, on our final GDS, we, we have some special additions that you wouldn't be usually um, knowledgeable of until you did this type of a thing. So first of all, we put special markers on layers. For example, when we have um, SRAMs, the SRAMs will have special markers that will say you can uh, have uh, special DRC rules because they will use something called push rules. So you have to have a marker there on it. Or we might have markers on analog areas that we don't want to add metal fill on top of because they're very sensitive. And we'll put a marker that will block the metal fill and so forth. We usually will put text labels all over our GDS to tell, tell us where the ports are and for different other types of things that we need to use. 
we'll add a chip logo. So chip logos are added and you can see here that we added a chip logo with the name of the course. Um, it will be a special layer that will eat away some of the top uh, metals or just be in the top metal and will be very distinct. You use that for identification of the chip, but you also use it for orientation. So for example, the package house will know what the orientation of the chip is before it connects it. There also, if you have a big enough chip, you will have reticle alignment um, uh, markings all around these fiducials and the different types of things that will help the machinery actually be able to align the different mass steps around. Um, so, so a lot of times those will have to be added to your GDS. Finally, you sometimes have to add a seal ring. Sometimes it's done for you in an academic environment. Um, what a seal ring is basically is a guard ring that you put around the die, so it's um, so it's protected when you do dicing. Dicing is cutting the chips, so you have a big wafer, and your wafer, the reticle goes over the wafer and prints out a lot of these chips. But the chips are not usually the size of the wafer, except for um, recently there was a company called Cerebrus that makes a wafer level die, but most uh, most die are much much smaller than a whole wafer and then you have to go and take this laser and cut them into pieces and while you're cutting them a lot of uh, uh, a lot of residue comes out of there and it can burn out the chips so first of all the one thing you do is you put a large area uh, um, between chips which is called a scribe line um, and, the, and that's where you cut so you're not cutting it so you make sure you're not cutting any chip but the other thing is you put uh, this guard ring around the chip that protects it and you can see here it's all these uh, metal layers and diffusions that will actually um, collect a lot of the this charge if it, if it goes around so you have to often add this seal ring before you um, tape out the design itself um, just as another note, in the scribe lines, a lot of times the foundries will put all kinds of metrology into there. So they'll put different ring oscillators to check uh, the process, different types of uh, sensors that will help them check how their process is coming out on each part of the wafer and each different wafer and so forth. Um, those are just used during uh, uh, manufacturing and they'll be cut away and ruined when we, we actually dice the chip. So a final point is resolution enhanced techniques. So before writing the mask, additional transformations are applied to the GDS. We provide this design, for example, in a 180 nanometer design, we would have um, drawn this type of an L shape and our mask would be that same L shape and we get a nice picture on our wafer, which would look pretty much like the L shape. But when we went down to um, lower uh, technology, such as 130 nanometers, if we provided that same L uh, with, with the mask that was exactly the same shape, we had diffraction and we get this ugly type of a mess over here so what we have to do is use optical proximity checks which add all kinds of nooks and crannies around and little corners and stuff and gives us a, a nice better picture um, at even lower technologies we have to use other tricks if we um, use this L probably at 90 nanometers we wouldn't have anything that would come out so we have to use phase shift masks and we have to use OPC that will, will get us our desired shape and it gets even more complicated when we go um, down to uh, lower technologies. Nowadays, uh, we're using 193 nanometer um, laser to fabricate uh, uh, to fabricate seven nanometer um, dimensions. Um, we've recently gone over to EUV, which is a whole new story, but um, really this is something that has to be done. And there are many of these uh, amazing things that the, the device guys, the uh, fabrication guys have, uh, have done. So if you wanna look again at OPC, if there was no OPC, this is the type of uh, thing we'd have. We have these corrections, which make a much nicer type of a uh, shape here. You see that this is the original layout. Uh, moderate OPC will add all these little things for even higher aggressive OPC will have more of it and it takes a real long time to um, create these masks and they're really expensive because we have these crazy OPC things that are run on them. Phase shift masks is one of these other tricks that are played so if we take a design and we have um, two slits in the mask there will be refraction so we'll have these uh, sink uh, type of shapes that will come out and um, when these things uh, um, connect to each other, we get the sum will be this really ugly and thick type of a line, and that's not what we want. So what we can do is actually use a phase shift mask, use an opposite phase for uh, adjacent lines, and then the first one is the red one, the second one, the, the opposite phase is the yellow one, and we can, when we combine them, we get these two peaks here, and these two peaks will make these nice two lines that will then be uh, etched away uh, to make our, uh, our feature on our chip. 
So just uh, uh, for a last point, I want to say that uh, there are some really nice examples that we can see. Um, a bunch of my friends at uh, ETH Zurich, they have a really cool thing. They've um, taped out up till now almost 500 chips over the last uh, two decades or so. And um, they put them all on uh, this nice chip gallery. Um, and so I wanted to show you guys uh, just some of that. And you can take your time afterwards and look at it. Um, there's the link over there. And you can see the uh, chips that they made. So there's 481 chips right now. And you can see these are all the chips going way, way, way back. Look deep into the oh, into the 80s. I didn't realize it was that long ago. And they do lots of real cool things. They use the density fill on top with uh, some images. You can see really cool chips that they made. For instance, this recent one called Raccoon. And this is a picture on the actual chip, OK? Um, Baikonur, that's uh, kind of cool. You can see the pulp uh, there, um, one, of the, one of their platforms, their RISC-V platform. They put the logo on here and so forth. Um, Arnold, that's a kind of cool ship. Uh, everybody loves Arnold, right? And uh, Mr. Wolf. So I just wanted to show you a few of that, and I really appreciate the stuff that they've done. I'm also uh, on a couple of these chips here. And just to close out our course, we have a final chip hall of fame. So um, for dessert, for our last thing, I actually took something that's not in the Chip Hall of Fame, but actually kind of like the Razzie of famous chips. For those who don't know, the Razzie is the Golden Raspberry. That's the prize given. That's the Oscar given for the worst movie of the year. Well, the Razzie of the famous chips is the Itanium or the Merced chip. It was a partnership between HP and Intel in 1994 where they wanted to produce the next big thing. Okay, the IA64 architecture, which was supposed to replace the x86 architectures and servers. It was this type of a uh, VLIW um, approach that was uh, supposed to be really um, to just uh, decimate all other servers. It was so big, it was announced in 1997. They expected to sell $38 billion worth of um, Itanium chips uh, by 2001. Intel stock rose by 5x by 2001, but... Uh, and uh, actually, companies such as Compaq, which were making the Alpha chips, and SGI, which were making the chips, uh, the MIPS chips, they just stopped their lines. They stopped making them entirely. However, when it was finally released in 2001, it had such bad performance, it actually sold only 1.8 billion um, chips in 2004, and it quickly became known as the Itanic. Um, uh, play on the Titanic and Itanium. So it really is considered one of the biggest flops in the history of chip design. It never really caught on. Um, AMD came out with the AMD 64 architecture, which turned into the x86-64 architecture um, later on, which was backwards compatible with x86. And it's really the 64-bit architecture that is still uh, used till nowadays. And, and, and really the Itanium, which was uh, recently stopped being uh, produced altogether, it just completely entirely failed. Um, in fact, uh, John Dvorak wrote in PC Magazine in 2009 that this continues to be one of the greatest fiascos of the last 50 years. And the great Donald Knuth, he wrote that the Itanium approach was supposed to be so terrific and turned, until it turned out that the wish for compilers were basically impossible to write. So really the problem, the biggest problem was that you, uh, to use these VLS, uh, VLIWs um, efficiently, you have to have these ex extremely good compilers that weren't available at the time. They were really hard to write, even today um, and uh, and it didn't run old software that wasn't recompiled for it very well so it just was really a train wreck okay so that's the final chip hall of fame but uh, the itanium had a lot of cool stuff in it that's and talked about and taught in computer architecture courses until today okay um, so just for this lecture there's uh, some uh, some references and that's it basically for the digital vsi design course. So I hope you all enjoyed and uh, I will see you in future videos.